Jordan B. Peterson recently sat down with Alex O'Connor. Alex O'Connor is a, um, I believe he's an atheist content creator. Uh, he does debates, and he's quite good at what he does. Uh, Jordan B. Peterson, as we all know, is a, a guy who has some ideas and some thoughts on things that we don't really care for. Mm. This is one of the things that I find puzzling, for example, about Dawkins, because Dawkins formulated the idea of mean, mm -hmm. which is, by the way, the same idea as archetype. It's exactly the same idea, except he just stopped. It's like, okay, there are memes. They're selected for. Okay, selected on what basis exactly? Yeah. Does that mean there's a hierarchy of memes? Are the memes more likely, that the, are the memes that are conserved more likely to be what would you say, viable organisms? This and if is, they're viable yeah. organisms, are they microcosms? This is really interesting. I genuinely kept hearing him. Wait, is he saying memes? He's saying memes. He has to be saying memes, right? Because I heard meme also, but the, there's no way he's talking about the hierarchy of memes. Yeah. Does that mean there's a hierarchy of memes? Oh, wait, no, he is talking about memes. He is saying memes. Are the memes more likely... That the, are the memes that are conserved more likely to be, what would you say, viable organisms? This and is, if they're viable yeah. organisms, are they microcosms? This is really interesting uh, in, in terms of the survivability, because there's a point, I, I've spoken to Richard Dawkins, well, a, a, a number of times, but twice on my podcast. And the second time, somebody pointed out to me that there might be a point of agreement between you two that, that hmm. has been overlooked, which is that I don't know if you've ever come across the the evolutionary argument against naturalism, or the argument from reason, the idea that if you're a materialist, you can't trust your, your reasonable faculties. So Alvin Plantinga formulated this very well, very, very geniusly, I think, in saying that if you believe that evolution by natural selection happens materially, what does natural selection select for? Survivability. Mm -hmm. So if you're a materialist, that means that the very rational faculty that you're using right now evolves not to be sensitive to truth, but to survivability. Yeah. Yes, that's and right. And if that's the case, well, Definitely. Why, why do you believe in the truth of evolution? Well, because you've been rationally convinced of it. But the thing that you've just assented to, the belief itself has just undercut the yes. process by which the, you came to that look, belief. There's right? a whole, the, the, the New England pragmatists figured this out in like 1880. Yeah, now, I think this right. is a fascinating. I, I think it really is just a... It is. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's exciting. It's, it's that, novel. That's it's for sure. Brilliant. That's so for sure. I asked, it, it's actually a point where Darwin and Newton do not come together. How do you mean? Well, the Darwinian definition of true and the Newtonian oh, definition sure. of true it, well, exactly. are not so, the so, same So here's thing, the thing. Right? Now, now, I asked Richard Dawkins about the evolutionary argument against naturalism. Yeah. I said, well, well, how can you know that what you believe is true? And he said, because believing true things makes me more likely to survive. Hey, hey, and oh I, boy, and watch I where you go with I that, I didn't catch man. it at the time, but I thought to myself... Okay, so it seems as though it begins with them just discussing what true, like how they define truth. I've heard, anyway, that uh, Peterson is going to get stumped here, and I think they might even deviate into religion, a religious conversation. Afterwards, it was one of my commenters on, on, on Patreon, actually, had, had mentioned this. He was listening to Richard, and I said, but, you know, but, okay, maybe, but sometimes it's at least possible that something that's false helps you to survive. You know, the rustling in the bushes, believing that that's a lion every time, or a tiger, mm -hmm. even if it's not, that helps you to survive, because that one right. time that it is, you're still going to run away. And yeah, that's a good point. Like, falsehoods can also help people survive. If it helps you survive, it does not become true, obviously. So saying like, I know this is true because it helps me survive uh, is really silly. I mean, what if you have somebody who is really depressed and they're about to kill themselves, but then they find religion and they feel like God has really saved them and given them a will to live? Well, now this thing helps them survive. It doesn't mean Christianity is just by default true. And it costs you nothing to run away when it's not a tiger. So believing it's a tiger, even when it's not, mm -hmm. is going to help me That's to survive. That's why we have a negativity bias. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. The word meme was created by Dawkins as an idea or behavior that spread. It was then hijacked by internet culture to mean something different. So that's what he meant when he was saying memes at the beginning. And, and, and Dawkins says, well, yeah, of course, there are some circumstances where believing something false could be beneficial to survival. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, how do you know that two plus two equals four is not one of those? Mm -hmm. And... It seemed as though he would he he was just saying that believing that would not 
be advantageous to our survival, which right. might well be true. But if that's the case, then suddenly I'm listening to what you're saying about uh, truth being more sort of Darwinian and related to survivability. And I think maybe you two would agree there. And then I think, well, why is it that when you sit down with Richard Dawkins, you find it difficult to have a conversation with each other? And and well, I think it's partly because we don't know each other very well. That's that's, that's right. And so true. and also uh, there are things he knows that I don't know. Yeah. And there are things I know that he doesn't know. Mm -hmm. Now, I would say in my defense that I, what would you say? I'm more of the aware, aware of the things he knows that I don't know than he is of the things I know that he doesn't know, right? So, for example... But they don't know that he knows what they don't know that they know that he knows. As far yeah. as I can tell, Dawkins doesn't know anything about the Jungian tradition of literary interpretation. Mm -hmm. And that actually, if you're going to talk about religion, that's actually a fatal flaw, mm -hmm. right? So, and, you know, he's called me, for example, drunk on symbols. It's like, well, the imagination is a biological function. Mm. And it has a structure and a purpose. Mm -hmm. And it has its own logos, its own intelligible yes. order. And if you're not aware of that order, that doesn't make me drunk on symbols. It just means you don't know what you're talking about. Now, that, so, that, that frustration that, that you... Uh, but nobody can know how somebody's imagination is working or how it's structured. Brain is biological, therefore my symbols are facts. Like, that's kind of what it sounds like he's getting at for sure. Appeal to you there. When you, mm -hmm. when you hear Richard Dawkins, um, I think Terry Eagleton said that listening to Dawkins on theology is like listening to somebody write a book about biology whose only knowledge of the subject is having once read the Great British Book of Birds. Mm -hmm. And okay, fair enough. Mm -hmm. that, but that actually turns out to be a real problem. But, and it's a problem with regards even to the meme idea, because... You don't have to extend Dawkins' work very far to understand that religious stories are memes. Sure. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and there's a hierarchy of memes, then, and some of them are very functional. But then here's the thing, like that frustration that you're sort of throwing in that direction, yeah. I think people throw it throw towards you and when, when you say, well, religion, you don't have to look very far to see that religion is a meme. Well, mm. without further clarification, and of course there's going to be it, you can understand why to, to somebody first listening, that sounds almost atheistic, well, religion is a meme. No, right? religion is not religion is not a, a true historical account of, you know, the, the history of the oh, universe. It's not a true historical it's, account. It's a meme. Now, it's, now it. It, when you say that, when you say that, so I guess when he's talking about a meme here, he's clearly talking about some kind of a story that may or may not be true, uh, but it spreads rapidly. Again, derived from the original meaning of the word being a biological function of something to spread. So he just means that the stories spread. Um, but Alex O'Connor, I like that he's kind of pointing him out for the optics here. Like, okay, I get what you're saying. Like, I know what you mean foundationally, but to everybody listening, it sounds like you pretty much just said like. God is a meme. When you say that, when you say that the resurrection of Jesus. Well, what does it mean historically that the spirit of God brooded upon the primordial waters? Like, what does that mean historically? Well, no one, no one knows. I what agree. That means I don't historically. think. I don't think right. that at least most of Genesis or parts of Genesis are supposed to be. I mean, the, the, the Bible is a, is, a, is a library, right? It's not a book, and that means that it's going to contain different genres. That's for sure. And so when we know, yeah, and some to, of them are more historically accurate, and some of them tilt more towards that that kind of elusive. I don't mean elusive in the. I mean, A L L U S I V. Yeah, sure. Right? That that elusive and symbolic form that characterizes so, Genesis 1. So, sure. because there are different genres here, it depends on what story we Which should also be wildly concerning if there is anybody that believes that religion or the Bible specifically is all historical fact. The way I was raised, I was raised uh, being taught that the Bible is fact and the Bible is literal. Now, Peterson is acknowledging that. It's going to depend. Some of the books of the Bible are far more symbolic. Some of the books of the Bible are far more historically accurate. The problem is, the Bible as a whole is supposed to be the Word of God. And if I have the Word of God, but I don't even know which chapter is telling me historical facts, and which chapter is telling me some whimsical, magical fairyland, then how do I know what is the fact and what isn't? I know Jordan Peterson is not like a Christian or anything like this, but I appreciate the fact that he admits this all the same, that there are parts of the Bible that are fiction, uh, parts of the Bible that are supposed to be stories, and parts of the Bible that are supposed to be historically accurate. What he doesn't seem to realize is, if that's the case, Christianity has lost even more credibility. We're talking about, and I that's think that what, sure. what I often observe you doing is, we might talk about uh, Christianity, and if you aren't comfortable committing to a historical ideal, you'll start talking about the, the spirit moving over the face of the waters, which is which is obviously a much more mythological ideal. Mm -hmm. um, and 
not not quite equivocating them, but but moving between them too quickly and, mm -hmm. and not delineating them enough. So if if I asked you, you know, do you think that the spirit moved across the face of the waters, and you said to me something like, I think it's still happening. Right, I'd that say, is what I would I'd say, say. Hey, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. It However, always happens. It some, happened at the beginning of time, and it's always happening. When somebody yeah. says, "Did the Exodus story happen?" I like that he's actually calling him on this now. Mm -hmm. Did did the did the Jews enslaved in Egypt break free of their slavery and move to the Promised Land across the desert for for forty years? Mm -hmm. Did that happen? Mm -hmm. You have also said of the Exodus specifically, it's still happening. Yes. Now, to me, that's far more inappropriate than saying that the spirit is still moving across the face of the waters, because I think what people mean there is, do you believe that these people in that time period actually did this in such a way that, for instance, might show up in an archaeological report? Well, I think that I thank you. Finally. Wow. A lot of maneuvering there to finally get to a really fair, straightforward question. You said you think this thing is still happening also. What does that mean? You know what people mean when they say this. If 600,000 Israelites traveled across the desert for 40 days and 40 or 40 years or whatever, then we would see archaeological findings of it. So now Peterson has kind of gotten himself in a corner where he's he's saying that he thinks the mythical magical things of the Bible are quote unquote still happening. But he also thinks that the supposed literal factual parts of the Bible are also still happening. The simplest answer to that is probably. Sure. And that's, right. that's fine. What do you believe that people in this time period actually did this thing in such a way that it would show up on an archaeological finding? And Jordan B. Peterson responds, probably? Sure, and that's, right. that's fine too. But, then, but we don't know. But then, but I then, mean, there is, like, to the degree that there's been archaeological investigations into the kinds of biblical narratives that you've described the archaeological evidence tends to fall on the side of historical accuracy in yeah. relationship to the bible quite surprisingly clearly, I mean, often. clearly you're, you're... no it doesn't what is he what there has never been any archaeological findings supporting the claim that six hundred thousand israelites traveled through the desert for 40 years there's no archaeological findings or evidence that there was ever even somebody named moses in egypt okay but yeah all-knowing, all-powerful God, and we get a probably. I mean, you've you spent more time in Exodus than probably any person I've ever met in person, right? Clearly, the story sort of captivates you, and you think it's really important and and, and can, no, can teach us a lot, right? Yeah, of course, it's infinitely deep but story. I think most people speaking to you already know that you think that, right? Mm -hmm. And so when they ask you a question, when when they suddenly say to you, "But do you think it really happened?" Well, what the hell does that mean? Uh, it means, Jordan, <laughs> do you think this thing happened for real, or do you think it is a fictional story they're like well you need to answer this question like so when when i i said do you want waffles and then now i just want to know like do you like waffles and jordan peterson's like what does that mean do you mean that intellectually i enjoy the fact that waffles provide me with a fair amount of nutritional value to get me through until my next meal or do you mean that i like waffles in the sense that they're generally flavorful what if they're not cooked properly? Would I still like them then? No, I really only like the ideal of what a waffle should be. I don't even know if I really like waffles. I actually like this imagination, this imaginative, fictional, perfect waffle. That's what I like. Like, it, it literally feels like that. Peter said, what the hell does that mean? It, it means, do you think it happened or not? <laughs> What they mean is what I was talking about a second ago, which is that sort of, um... What, what, okay, so fine. So it's easy just to turn this again, around. It's, it's like, okay, what exactly happened in, in your historical account when Moses encountered the burning bush? I don't need to know exactly what happened. What I need to know is I'm, that, I'm not asking you specifically I know, I know. or, or what, attacking you for that. What I need I'm to just... know is that if I sort of went to the Egyptian desert at sort of the time that this story is alleged to have take, taken place in history, would I see a mass movement? of Israelites from Egypt into the Promised Land? Would I see people with feet walking through the desert leaving footprints? Well, I, let's, let's, let's take it apart rationally. So, and, and, But you also understand that when, when someone's asking that, and you want, like, even if you don't like the question, you must understand what's happening. He like, has to break it down. Imagine you have a time machine, okay, and you go back to that specific time. Do you think the thing that said would be happening would be currently happening when you arrive in that time period? And even Peterson then is like, well, let's break this down into subcategories. The first subcategory is a... You must also understand that when you then say, it's still happening, yeah. people just go, what are you talking about? Yeah, well, I would say that's not my problem. Hmm. But it's... it's it
if you said it, it kind of is your problem. If you say something stupid, and then people say, what the fuck, dude, why are you saying stupid shit? You don't get to respond, it's not my problem. It became your problem when you decided to say something stupid. It becomes a problem when you understand that someone's asking a quite banal historical question. Well, yeah, but you don't get to do that. But why not? Why? Because the stories that you're dealing with aren't banal. I agree, but like... Uh, one so you can't reduce them to something one, banal? One, even uh, if it... Yes, you sh Okay, if it's a historical thing that happened, you should be able to reduce it to a pretty straightforward historical fact. If the Bible says 600,000 Israelites traveled through the desert in this region, we should be able to look in th that region and see evidence of this. If it was, in fact, a historical fact. It's like so simple. And Peterson's like, you can't reduce it to a simple question because the story is really not very simple. It can be a complicated story included with a simple question. Even if it's, what would you call it? Even if it's reassuring, one this actually happened. It's, well, then what do you do with the burning bush? So what one, this actually happened. One comparison I would make is, um, between this and talking about fiction more broadly. Yeah. Right. Well, you got. Yeah. Honestly, I would like to believe that Jordan Peterson's jacket didn't happen. I would like to believe that this fucking outfit didn't happen. But seriously, this is uh, this is actually getting kind of embarrassing for Peterson now. Like he he cannot get himself out of this. Why does he keep pivoting to the burning bush? Nobody's asking about the burning bush. We're asking in regards to a pretty big claim that would leave behind really large amounts of evidence, do you think this thing really happened? Well, you got it right earlier, you know, I would say. Mm -hmm. you, know, you noted that the, the, the stories in the, in, in, the, in the biblical library leap across genres, yes. right? Well, we know this because sometimes they're poetry and sometimes, sometimes they're songs, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like, so, so in any given story, there's going to be historical account yeah. plus mythological overlay. Yeah. And, you know, you have to be a discriminating reader to kind of see what's different. And you don't just get to say, well, all the mythological symbolism is historical reality yeah. it's like no it's not but here's the thing yeah, but, but but you said it's still happening and if this thing is still happening then we're going to assume you're talking about the same fucking reality that we all share you schizophrenic dementia patient jordan b peterson jordan benzos peterson are you back on the fucking drugs dude you just said that there is a difference some of it's historical some of it's not Alex gave you a very straightforward scenario of a story in the Bible that Peterson himself has already agreed that he thinks is a historical fact. Now, when challenged, well, do you think this thing that you said is historical really happened? Peterson's going, well, no, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't get to ask me to make the difference between the what's mythical and what's not now. <laughs> Who made me the lore master? Take a, a piece of trivial fiction like Forrest Gump. Yeah. Right. We say like, okay. Did that happen? Now, I, I think that what you'd probably say is something like, well, I don't think the events literally occurred, but I think that they obviously get at something that's sort of perennially true about human right, exactly. I suppose I said that's to, right. But so on, they happened to, but, they existed as a pattern. But there's a, but there's a scene in Forrest Gump when, you know, he, I think he meets the president. Is it JFK at the time? I think he goes and meets John F. Kennedy. Yeah. And so I said to you, well, well is, is JFK the, the, like that part of that specific part of that story? Is it, is it true that JFK was the president? Right. And you would probably just say, yeah. Yeah. You, you wouldn't say anything more complicated. And even though the subject as a whole, like, is Forrest Gump true? Is Hamlet true? That's a complicated question. Very. But specifically, when I say, ah, but interestingly, there's this, there's this, there's this little point I want to make up in, in this broader discussion. Do you think that, he, that JFK was actually the president? You say yes. Why do you think it matters to people? Yes. Thank you. Nice. Really excellent call out right there, Alex. A story like Forrest Gump. What does it really mean when you ask, did this happen? Did it happen as far as them actually recording this thing? Yeah. But did it happen to the point that it's true historical fact? No. It is more complicated. There, is, there are many layers to a movie like Forrest Gump. But when it comes to s small little details, was JFK the president at this time? Yes. Peterson has no problem answering it. But when it comes to the Bible... When it comes to, you're saying this might be mythical, or maybe it's based on something that's real, but do you think that this little bit here is true? Do you think this little bit really happened? When it comes to that in the Bible, Peterson just melts down. Like, I don't know. What, these well, are ancient accounts. Let's maybe say that's the, the biggest problem. Maybe that's the biggest problem that, that you have with the people who are asking these it questions. It is. And like, hopefully... why, why, what, what point are you trying to make here? So you, The point is, I know what the point usually is, is the people who are asking the question believe that true in unerringly means objectively happened in history like the things that we're seeing right now happen. Yep. It's like, well, 
No, so that's for, not how that's that's what not what those stories are like. For me, I, I, some of it is, but for, yeah, but if those stories are detailing things happening that are completely contrary to the way in which things happen that we experience nowadays, it would be far more realistic to deduce that that story is fiction than assume that all of reality used to be different. Christian, when asking that, it's probably because for them they have an understanding of Christianity that requires believing in that kind of truth. For me, yeah, no, and, and the reason why, why I hope that like me asking these questions will be less frustrating to you is because I have no desire for that. I don't care about that. I'm genuinely just interested yes. in what you think. Yeah, and so I my, my, my desire to know whether you think Exodus historically happened goes no further than a point of interest about your beliefs. Well, so there's, there's elements of the, especially the setup to the Exodus story that strike me as very, very plausible historically. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the, the Jews before the Pharaoh of that time were under the guidance and protection of Joseph and the previous Pharaoh. And they regarded the Israelites as benefactors because they had Joseph had helped save the kingdom mm -hmm. and his people were welcome. But that was forgotten. And so the new Pharaoh and the new Egyptians regard the appallingly successful Jews as destructive interlopers and they make them um yeah but like how much of this is actually true so we know at the same time that uh the exodus account about the israelites fleeing egypt we know around this time there was also a lot of political tension between these groups so it sounds like what he's talking about actually is this historical tension how do you know this historical tension isn't what led people to De devise these stories about the evil Egyptians enslaving God's chosen people. It kind of sounds like the kind of story, the kind of propaganda that might pop up when there are two regions warring with each other or feuding with each other. So like even him bringing up that there was this drama, he's right. But that drama arguably could have contributed to the falsehoods of the Exodus story. Because there are no Egyptian records of Moses. There are no Egyptian records of any of this. There's no Egyptian records of them enslaving 600,000 Israelites. And the Egyptians, to my understanding, were really good at, at keeping records in that time period. It's like, well, can you believe that? <laughs> it happens all the time. Sure. It's happening right now. So it's, so it's, it's it very plausible. That in this particular case, saying it's very plausible. What? Do, does it, I mean, it's happening all the time. People are still enslaved nowadays. You know what they're asking, Peterson. Nobody's asking if slavery still happens nowadays. We're asking if you think during that specific time, God led this group of people out of this region. And he's weaseling everywhere. He clearly doesn't have an answer. He doesn't know the answer. And now he's just uh, vomiting out a bunch of word salad, hoping that the, uh, the, the subject just moves on. It's, mm -hmm. it's like saying something like, well, yeah, it could have happened. I don't know. Well, I, I don't know. So, so I, mean, when somebody, I don't think anybody knows. So when somebody so, asks, D did the Exodus really happen? That, that word really, when they say, yeah, like, if I just really said, really is the, is the if, crux. If I said, did the Exodus happen? And, and I'd understand why you would then say, well, you've got to understand what kind of story this is. Fine. Yes. But then if somebody says, yeah, but did it really happen? Even well, which then, parts of it? Even if they're not expressing it very well, like what they're getting at there is they're trying to emphasize the, the historicity. They're trying to say, yeah, but did it historically happen? Probably is what they mean by the word really there. Right. But, but the thing is, it speaks of their, see, they have a, problem is is that christians who ask that have a metaphysics that's not christian mm -hmm. while there is not a detailed metaphysical system specified in scripture that all christians must embrace the bible certainly does speak to metaphysical issues including the ultimate nature of god he's a singular being eternally existing in three persons the cosmos okay so it sounds like if the bible doesn't even provide a clear metaphysical system that christians are meant to adhere to how are you then saying that Christians asking this question are not following the Christian medical uh, metaphysical framework? It doesn't even sound like there is a universal Christian metaphysical system to abide by. It's not provided in the Bible. We're making fun of JP because of his outfit. No, we made one joke about his outfit and the rest of it, we've been making fun of him for getting stumped with a really, really basic question. It sounds to me watching this that um, Jordan Peterson does not think that this historically is a fact, but he also knows saying that would probably piss off a fuck ton of his conservative Christian audience. So he just tries to weasel around it for the sake of his own brand. That's my guess. 
I don't know at the end of the day, but like the types of questions being asked are, are, are like, these were such simple questions. Huge props to Alex O'Connor for debating Jordan Peterson so well and for uh, really calling him out and speaking his language really, really well. Okay, there's another one. I have no dog in this fight. I'm not a Christian. Yeah. But I know that a lot of Christians are frustrated when they begin asking about Jesus, who's a much more physical entity. Mm -hmm. right? It's a real human being. It's someone mm -hmm. flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. It's someone who's physically crucified by yeah, the It's Romans. a very different question. It's a very different question. And then, and then is, is seen as a physical entity, mm -hmm. at least according to the, to the canonical tradition, by his disciples after he died. Yeah. So when somebody asks you, do you believe that that happened? Mm -hmm. And when I've seen you ask about that question, you tend to still speak in terms of the psychological and the mythological. I think the frustration is that, as you've just said, yeah, that, these are two I don't mind frustrating right? Christians on, in that regard either, because the truth of the matter is, with regard to the gospel accounts, that the mythological and the historical are inextricab inextricably cross-contaminated. Sure. There's no pulling out the historical Jesus, right? That just that's that's a non-starter. The okay, well, that alone is a massive flaw for uh for, for your religion, not Jordan Peterson himself, but for the religion of Christianity. If there's no separating fact from fiction when it comes to the character of Jesus Christ, then yeah, no thanks. Because it's according to Christianity that I need to believe in this thing wholeheartedly or I'm going to burn for all of eternity. Okay? And if you're telling me I need to believe in this thing wholeheartedly but you can't even differentiate between what's fact and what's fiction about this person? Nah. No. Fuck you. I'll, I, will, uh, I will go and burn for eternity then. And why that is, I don't know. It's, it's, very, it's very mysterious. It's very hard to understand, as is, are, are the, let's say, the accounts of the resurrection. Okay, so what do I think about that? Well, I, don't, I think that denying the historical reality of Christ is, I think that's just a fool's errand. Of course. I don't know why anybody would bother with so, it. So a man exists called Jesus. We yes. That much. Now, Christ, now, there's a claim that, that is attributed to Christ that he is the embodiment or the incarnation, the fulfillment, let's say, of the prophet and the laws. Yes. I think that's true. Uh -huh. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, you know, what did, I think it's in the Gospel of John. I think Gospel of John closes with a statement that something like, if all the books that were ever yes. written were written about the Gospel accounts, that would be enough books to explain what it happened. Yeah, if, if, we like, could, if yes. all the things that Jesus did. Yeah, yeah, and, it's, and it's, there's, a, there's a truth in that. The truth is that profound religious account is bottomless, mm -hmm. and the biblical representations are like that. There's no limit. Or really well-written ancient fictional stories are, have no bottom. Like, doesn't that seem kind of convenient? The end of this, this book, you're like, there aren't even enough pages in the entire world to write down all the good things this person did. Not least because the text it's, itself is deeply cross-referenced. So there's like, there's an innumerable number of paths through it. It's like a chessboard. And so it, it's, it's inexhaustible in its interpretive space. That's true. And so partially what it sounds like Peterson is doing is overcomplicating Christianity to such an extent that he's like, because it is so complicated and profound, I just am too humble as a mortal man to even try and understand this thing. When in reality, it's like, you're kind of making it more complicated here. You're kind of obsessed with this, like, everything's cross-referenced to the history of the fact. Okay, how about, like, people say the Bible happened or that the Bible is God's word? It's really important for Christianity that Jesus Christ existed and rose from the dead because you need to believe that fact to get to heaven. So why don't we talk about that? But instead, he, he's like, well, it's cross-referenced to this one ancient text, which could mean this, which could be... How about you just focus on one thing? Pick something, historical accuracy, about Jesus rising from the dead, and then just stick to it. He's overcomplicating it so much so to basically give himself an easy out from needing to contend with all of these obvious contradictions in his worldview. It's inexhaustible in its interpretive space. That's true. And, and that's a problem too, because it, it means it's also susceptible to multiple interpretations, including potentially competing interpretations. I think a lot of people interpret Paul, for example, um, uh, the earliest New Testament source, as saying that if Jesus did not literally rise from the dead, mm -hmm. if, if there was not a man who stopped breathing and started breathing again, then your faith is futile and you're still mm -hmm. in your sins. That is, Christianity is undermined. Mm -hmm. Now. Mm -hmm. That means that, and Paul doesn't say sort of believing that that's false is really bad. He says, if you do not believe this proactively, yeah. then your faith is, yeah, is futile. The problem so, I so have with if, that. If you don't proactively yeah. believe that yourself, then I think when a Christian asks you, you know, do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Are you a Christian? I think you must be committed to saying no, at least under that interpretation of Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and even if you're not sure.
Thank you, Alex O'Connor, once again for calling him out. I like that he's making very similar arguments to what I was just saying, that yes, if you are required by Christianity to believe this thing, your faith is built on this thing, it's kind of important as to whether or not it really happened historically or not. Jordan Peterson really is super predictable. Well, I mean, it's fine if, if I say to you, do you think that a man physically rose from the dead? And you say something like, well, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't there, but hmm. I think it has a lot of mythological significance. Or I think that maybe it, it happened in a, in a different sense or it happened in the sense that good fiction happens, you hmm. know, then fine. But it needs to begin with that caveat of, of the simple sort of historically speaking, I don't know. And I know you don't like to pull out the historical well, well, that, that's, mythological, a, that's but, a good objection. But it's, it's an important a, question to ask. No, of course. It's a very good objection. So the so I just did a seminar on the Gospels with a crew of about eight people. And it was the same crew that walked through Exodus with me with yeah. a couple of variations. And we spent a lot of time on the resurrection account. Dude, just answer if it's fact or fiction. Of course, that was the toughest, let's say, that was the toughest morsel to chew and digest. The thing about the resurrection accounts is that they're all, look, so I could say something like this. Which was, Why were they so hard to digest? Was it because there was a lot of really strong evidence casting doubt on the resurrection of Jesus? Is it because the only quote unquote evidence that Christians have of the resurrection is actually just ancient accounts? ancient claims, no different than people 20 years ago claiming they saw Elvis back from the dead, no different than people 30 years ago claiming they were abducted by aliens. It's the exact same thing. It's just an old claim. And that's their evidence. Maybe that was what was the, uh, maybe that was the tough morsel to chew. I believe the accounts, but I have no idea what they mean. When you say See. you believe the accounts, do you mean, and, and I, I hate to- Okay. Yeah, you're right, Jordan. Congratulations. You have actually pissed off some people, me included. How do you believe something if you don't know what it means? When you say you believe the accounts, do you mean, and, and I, I hate to be sort of yeah. pedantic here, it seems pedantic, but do you mean you believe that these are things that happened such that if I, if that's, now, that's a strange I know you don't state. like that, let me put it this yeah. way, if, if I... Hold on, whoa. Don't ask me if I think this story in the Bible really happened or not, okay? <laughs> Careful now. Went back in time with a Panasonic video camera and put that camera in front of the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea mm -hmm. Would the little LCD screen show a man walk out of that tomb? I would say, suspect yes. So that, that, is, that to me seems like a belief in the historical event of the resurrection, or at least of Jesus leaving the tomb, which means that when somebody says, you know, do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? It doesn't seem clear to me why you're not able to just say, it would seem to me yes. Because I have no idea what that means. And neither did the... He just told you what it meant. He just gave you a clear example of what it would mean. And now you're backtracking to like, I have no idea what it, what it means. This is actually really embarrassing for Jordan Peterson. I mean, I know that he's stupid and I know that Jordan Peterson has kind of always been uh, the retard's version of a smart person. But seriously, this is just, this is abysmal. Because I have no idea what that means. And neither did the people who saw it. Hmm. Neither did the people who saw it. Y they, they did because they wrote it down. They wrote down what happened. I think the, the real problem at the end of the day is Jordan Peterson doesn't know if he believes in the resurrection of Christ. He doesn't know if he's a Christian or not. Because he's, he's overcomplicated Christianity to such an extent that he's basically made it in his mind this impossible mountain to climb so that he never has to worry about climbing it.